So welcome everybody. It's so great to have you all here today. Today's topic is all about slavery in America. We're going to look at the Constitution as well as the Reconstruction Amendments that happened after the Civil War. That's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. My name is Curry Sautner. I'll be your moderator today, kind of walking you through this with our top scholar today, Tom Donnelly. So welcome, Tom. It's great to have you. Would you like to say hi to everybody? Sure. Thank you, Curry. Hi, I'm Tom Donnelly. I am a Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitution Center. Thanks so much for joining us here on this Veterans Day to talk about the history of slavery in America. That's how we have a lot to get through in a half an hour, and I'm really excited. And students, remember, always put your questions in the Q&A or the chat. We really like to make sure we get your questions in, and we'll weave them in throughout the program. Tom has a lot to do today, and this is an amazing story and a sad story about America's history, America's past, and these documents. And we're gonna dive into the hard history and really open it up. But I wanna start, Tom, with kind of two big questions and then, then another goal, because I like to give you a lot of work in these classes. Number one, kind of the big question that always spins around this is, we know that slavery was embedded into, the, um, into America's fabric prior to the Constitutional Convention, prior to the ratification of the Constitution. But the questions that we have around the Constitution really wrap around the idea of, were there parts of the Constitution that made it harder for our country to end slavery and made it into such a bloody battle and war? So I guess that breaks down to the way to look at it is, was the Constitution a pro-slavery document or was it an anti-slavery document? And so that's one of kind of the big question. And we hear this debate today, Tom, so I think it's so important to talk about it and to lay it out for our students so they can make their own decisions. Second question is around the big, big amendments that were added to the Constitution after the Civil War. 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. These amendments changed the Constitution so much that some historians call it the second founding. And so that's the second question I have for you. Is it, what, is it as huge as the first founding with Madison and Hamilton and Washington? Is, that, is it what Lincoln said, it's a rebirth of freedom and it is like a second founding for our country? So those are two big ideas as we go through this history and tell the stories of these amazing people in our past. And then on top of it, because I, it is Veterans Day and it is such an amazing story, there's so many impressive African-American veterans that made sure that we had freedom in our country for all. So if you could weave that into the storyline too, that's all I have for you to do. Real piece of cake. <laughs> oh, really? A, a, a modest set of goals. That should be, that should be nice and simple. In 30 minutes. In just 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Curry, I think that that's a great way to frame the discussion today. And, you know, I think that one thing we'll see running through a lot of the conversations is that that contemporary question that we ask about, was the Constitution a pro-slavery or an anti-slavery document is one that really began at the Constitutional Convention and that we continued to have for the rest of our history, especially it was such a key part of the conversations that we see in the 1800s between all sides of the slavery question. So we see pro-slavery voices and anti-slavery voices laying claim to the Constitution's text and history and using those constitutional arguments to advance their vision of the Constitution around their own views about slavery. So we wanna really have that in mind as we're reviewing a lot of the history we're going to cover today. That question is contemporary, but it's one that goes all the way back. And the other is really, we're gonna go from the original constitution to the reconstruction amendments. So that the amendments that we added to the constitution after the civil war. And so as, as you're listening and thinking about the lecture today, I really want you to think hard about what we say about the original constitution and some of the compromises over slavery that we see there. Think about the debates that happened on each side and how those compromises came about. Think about what effect you think that they had on the Constitution through the 1800s up to the Civil War. And then think really hard about how much did the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, truly transform the Constitution. I'm not going to hide the ball. I think it was a second founding for our nation. Um, uh, so I'm not going to try to say, oh, but, but really, learn that, list, you know, obviously participate in the conversation today, learn more, and reach your own decision. You don't have to listen to me. You can find out, you can even if you think about it yourself. Um, but so that's a little bit about the framing. Let's go, should we go right back? Should we start with the history, even before the Constitutional Convention and march our way to Philadelphia? Does that make sense? Yes, because I think it's so much about enslavement in the Constitution starts with how do these colonies start and what is the infrastructure they put into the system of life and of the economy before the Constitution that affects the way the Constitution is written. 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's say a little bit about uh, the South and a little bit about the North, and then we'll get to the convention. So let's start with the, the colonies in the South. Um, uh, you know, when we're thinking about slavery, slavery is obviously older than the Constitution, older than the Republic. And what we see in, you know, many colonies during colonial times is slavery being written into the colonial law itself. So as early as 1660 in Virginia, we see slavery written into the law. In the 1700s, we see these colonies, slave codes transforming the institution of slavery itself, making slavery what we would say is inheritable. That means it's a condition that is passed on from mother to child. It's based on race, it's African-Americans. And this is what, when we talk about chattel slavery, this is what we mean. It's a system that's based on that passing on from parent to child and based on really racial caste, treating people unequally because of their race. That's the institution of slavery. That's not just part, it's not just embedded in the economy of a lot of these slaveholding states, but it's in the very fabric of the law itself. And so what do we see? What sort of transformations do we see in the colonies leading up to the Constitutional Convention? Well, just take Virginia, for instance, one of the leading states uh, you know, in the, in the early Republic, one of our largest, our largest states. Um, you know, what do we see about the population of enslaved people in Virginia during colonial times? I have the numbers written here. If you're looking at 1680, enslaved people made up just 7% of the Virginia population. Um, uh, by 1700, it's 28%. And by 1750, so a couple decades before the Constitutional Convention, it's a whopping 46% of the Virginia population are enslaved people. And so what we're seeing as we're, as we're moving towards the American Revolution and towards the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia is that we're seeing an institution that's deeply embedded in the Southern law, in the Southern economy, and that you know anything that we're going to say once we're writing our constitution is gonna to have to wrestle with the fact that there are strong Southern slaveholding in, in, uh, uh, interests that are tied in with the institution of slavery. But of course, Curry, you know, we often think of slavery as a Southern institution, but we see enslaved people in the North as well during this period. And so, you know, for instance, New York had quite a few enslaved people. So it isn't just a Southern institution. It's one that we also see in Northern states. But as we're speeding towards, you know, as we're getting into the decade before the Constitutional Convention, the late seven, eight, 1770s and into the 1780s, we are seeing some of the Northern states move towards freedom, moving towards emancipation, freeing their enslaved people. And so, for instance, take Vermont, their 1777 constitution abolishes slavery. Consider Massachusetts. They have a decision in 1783 by their Supreme Court, the Supreme Court Judicial Court that abolishes slavery in Massachusetts. And then we see other states like Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Connecticut also in the 1780s moving towards what's called gradual emancipation. And this means we're not gonna get rid of the, the, the institution of slavery immediately, but over time we are going to, we're going to free enslaved people's children. Um, and so this, as, you know, as, as we've often talked about, this can be, uh, it, it's very gradual. We're talking about decades and decades mm -hmm. into the future. But if we're thinking about the trend line in the North leading into the Constitutional Convention, it's clear. These states are moving towards freedom. They're moving towards emancipation. And as we're then getting to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, we're going to see a clash of interests here between Northern states, which are becoming more and more free, and Southern states, which are becoming more and more um, reliant on the institution of slavery. So I'll pause there, Curry, before we yeah. get to the convention. And I know our students are older in this group, so I just want uh, older and or more advanced in their, their study. I, I wanted to take one beat and one pause on the American Revolution because is this, what well, it feels like to me when I look at this history and I look at the writings of people at the convention, it feels like they walk into the revolution. There's some understanding and acknowledgement that they're saying all men are created equal, but not doing it. And that there's almost this moment in time after the revolution where it was almost closer to ending enslavement than it would be for another 150 years. So can you talk a little bit about how the revolution kind of inspires a more open freedom? I know, and I'll just say it, I, want to I love talking about Dickinson at this moment, that this is this mind shift for people like Dickinson to say, this is not right. I knew it wasn't right, but I have to change. Absolutely. I mean, so just take the Declaration of Independence, for instance, you know, where we're so one, of course, we know all men are created equal written in the Declaration of Independence. And that sets up exactly what you're saying, Curry, is we fought a revolution, you know, in part based on an idea, that core idea that all men and eventually all women are created equal, we're endowed by our creator with certain alienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and what could be more antithetical to that, more opposed to that, 
than the institution of slavery. And so we do, we see in the, in, in the 1770s into the 1780s, the beginning of some figures in the founding generation moving towards anti-slavery and abolitionist views, including, you know, once we get to the, the convention in the early Congress, you see Benjamin Franklin, you know, being a, a mm -hmm. key figure along those lines. But as we're putting together the Declaration of Independence, we even see a conflict between Southern slaveholders. We see Thomas Jefferson writing a draft of the Declaration of Independence that, you know, the Declaration, of course, being, you know, expressing to King George III in the world why we need freedom, why we need independence. And with, you know, part of what Jefferson's saying there is uh, a complaint against King George III about the brutality of the international slave trade. And so we see very strong language there up on the screen. And what this does, though, you see then just immediately, you see other Southern, uh, you know, Southern figures in the Confederation Congress immediately pushing back, uh, the Continental Congress pushing back and having Thomas Jefferson eliminate this language. And so you're seeing here even, you know, and those, those largely figures in the Deep South, so from like South Carolina, important figures there. And so you're even seeing among slaveholders in that founding generation, a conflict between those in the Upper South Virginia, like Thomas Jefferson, and those in the lower South, the, the delegates in South Carolina, like Rutledge. And so with that, what you end up seeing is some, you know, there, there, is, there ends up being some, um, uh, you know, thought that, you know, eventually the institution of slavery, even for those voices in the upper South, the slavery may all end up fizzling out over the decades. It's not inevitably gonna remain part of the Republic, but you see also for figures like, you know, George Mason, who's a slaveholding Virginian, um, uh, uh, oppose, uh, they end up uh, speaking out against brutal things like the international slave trade, where you see figures in the, in, the, in the deep south continuing to defend it. And so this is all just to say that, you know, the revolutionary ethos, that, that, that declaration of independence yeah. ends up opening up the space of debate and opening up way more radical positions than we would have had, you know, prior to then. Uh, so I think that's, that's sort of a good way to, a good read into the convention, I think. Larry. Yeah, I think it's great. And so they get to the convention, and there's three big sections of the Constitution that really don't directly say slavery, but address slavery. So can you talk to us a little bit about these three big clauses? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the, the first and arguably the most important of these clauses is the three-fifths clause. And so what's going on in, here is that, uh, you know, through this clause, we're saying that enslaved people will count as three-fifths of a person for purposes of congressional uh, representation. So back, just to back up, let's remember, the, if we're talking about the U.S. House of Representatives. The U.S. House of Representatives, we decide how many members each state gets based upon the population of that state. So if you're a larger state, you get more representatives. And so here we're trying to say that the delegates are debating, well, what do we do with enslaved people? So if, you know, for the Southern slaveholding delegates of the convention, they're arguing our enslaved people are people they should count as five-fifths of a person, as a full person for purposes of congressional representation. With this argument, then they get more political power in the new Congress, more representatives, and so interest skewing more in their direction. So they're arguing for five fifths. On the other side though, you see Northern anti-slavery delegates, Northern delegates as a whole, arguing strongly that this is ridiculous. This is rank hypocrisy. Why? Well, Southern slaveholders, you do not treat enslaved people as human beings, as true people, as rights-bearing individuals, why in the world should we give you more congressional representation based on those numbers? You, you know, when we think about representation, when we think about even voting at the founding, part of it is connected to really serving the interests of the people around you. And you are not serving the interests of the enslaved people. And so because of this, we should count enslaved people as zero fifths for purposes of congressional representation. We should just go with non-enslaved people, their populations determining how many members there are in Congress. And so, you know, there's a way in which, Curry, as, as we're looking at this language, that language you highlighted of three-fifths of all other persons, you know, it, it hits us in the gut, you know, saying mm. that, you know, are we really just saying that enslaved people, they're not full people, they're three-fifths of a person? That seems disgusting to us today. Uh, but the debate that you see at the convention is ultimately a debate over political power with a, sort of a flip in what you would expect. You might expect some anti-slavery northerners say that they're a full person and, and southerners saying that they are... Uh, uh, you know, zero fifths. But in the end, uh, what happens is that Roger Sherman of Connecticut, one of the compromisers extraordinaire at the convention, uh, gets the delegates to say, it's not going to be zero fifths. It's not going to be five fifths. It's going to be three fifths. We'll meet somewhere near the middle. And this ends up being significant because over time, you know, it ends up boosting Southern slaveholding power throughout the national government. So the most obvious thing is that it boosts congressional representation, the number, of the number of U.S. House seats in the South, 
by three fifths of a person for each enslaved person. So that's in increasing the Southern slaveholders political power in Congress. But also remember, this is also going to boost their power in the electoral college. And then in turn, it's gonna boost their power in the Supreme Court as presidents who are elected through that electoral college appoint justices. And so we just see this, this three fifths clause magnifying the political power of the slaveholding South reverberating throughout the 1800s. I think this is really important for our teachers that are working with students is, and I remember like younger students get lost here. They're like, oh, that's awful, but you get three fifths of rights. And I'm like, no, that's not how enslavement worked. So the, the Southern states get the power, but the enslaved people get no rights or very, very little rights that are actually followed through with. That's exactly right. It's, it's, more, it's more voting power for the white slaveholding South, very few rights to no rights for African-American enslaved people. Now let's move on to the Fugitive Slave Clause. Sure, no, so this is the second big compromise that you see at the convention. And so this, this language is saying that if you're a Southern slaveholder, what you're able to do is you can go into the North or you can go into the federal territories and you can try to retrieve people that you claim who were enslaved by you and escaped to freedom. And so this is extending the reach of the slaveholding power up to the North into the federal territories. Now, a weird thing about this clause is you don't see many debates at the convention over it. The delegates wound up being you know, largely okay with it. And the reason was that this language is drawing upon language that they were all familiar with already. Um, language uh, that dates back to the Articles of Confederation. So the framework of government that was before the US Constitution and also to the Northwest Ordinance, which was a key, um, which was a key measure passed by the Confederation Congress that dealt with uh, slavery in the territories. So it, it, it tried to keep the slavery out of the territories, but it did have a clause that permitted slaveholders to go into the territories and retrieve alleged fugitive slaves. And so what we end up seeing here is, although it ends up not being a major flashpoint of debate at the Constitutional Convention, it's a huge flashpoint of, of debate all throughout the 1800s leading up to the Civil War with Congress passing multiple fugitive slave acts that empower Southern slavehold, slaveholders to go into effectively free soil to go and retrieve alleged fugitive slaves. And at the same time, Northern free states saying, why are you on our, why are you coming here under our soil and enforcing slavery? This, this impinges upon our state's rights, our sovereignty. Um, and so it ends up hitting, interestingly, the arm of the national government in the interest of Southern slaveholders trying to retrieve alleged fugitive slaves pitted against states' rights and the federalism and the state power that you would, that, uh, of the Northern free states saying, don't come on our soil and do this. We do not want to help you. We do, want, do not want to help this institution that we find abhorrent. Okay. And last kind of major section of the, the structural constitution, the slave trade clause. Okay, so this is the last one. This ends up being a very heated debate at the convention. And it's a question of, you know, what power will the national government have to end the international slave trade? Now, remember, this is, this is a, a, an institution that even many slaveholders in the Upper South, like in, in Virginia, so key figures, even like George Mason, the Virginian slaveholder, uh, finds the international slave trade brutal, terrible, inhumane, and wants to see it abolished. He doesn't want to abolish slavery, but he does want to abolish the international slave trade. And so we see a coalition of, of delegates from the Upper South and from the North coming together and saying, Either we need to ban this out right now or we need to give Congress the power to do this immediately. And then we see Southern slaveholders from the deep South, for instance, from South, states like South Carolina, pushing back and saying, no, 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 we need the international slave trade to continue. We don't want to empower the national government any more than it's, you know, we're already empowering it here. And we want to take this, make sure that Congress does not have this power. And so what ends up happening is that there ends up being a compromise here that makes no one happy. Um, and what, what, the, what the delegates settle on is that you know, 1808 is the dividing line. Before 1808, Congress can't ban the international slave trade, but after 1808, after 1808, Congress, uh, from 1808 rather onward, Congress will have the power to ban the international slave trade, and Congress did. They did the second that they could ban the international slave trade, they did, but in the intervening 20 years, we see tens of thousands of new enslaved people being brought from Africa onto our shores. And so it wound up having a true human cost. Yeah, and then the slave trade shifts. So instead of being, you know, forced to come here from other places, you get this internal slave trade that begins to happen, especially in the southern states. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you end up seeing it, it, it's, it's a form of just 
shifting around the enslaved people that are already here. We're not abolishing slavery, but we're, we're allowing people to trade in between states. And so absolutely, and like part of the argument, you know, this, the cynical argument about this, the international slave trade is that for the upper you know, South, those Southern slaveholders, maybe they wanted to uh, shut down the international slave trade so it increased the value of their own enslaved people. So that's sort of, that's the cynical argument for why their interests may have lined up that way. But nevertheless, we do see uh, m trading all throughout uh, you know, the 1800s of slaves internally in the United States. Yeah, there's a, a book called the, the Half That's Never Been Told. I will send it out in the group. That it, it's a huge book, but it is deep into kind of that conversation about the economy of the internal slave trade, if you wanted to dive into that deeper. Now, Tom, before the Constitution, during the Constitutional Convention and after, we have groups of people that are pushing back that are fighting against enslavement. Um, and I wanted to really quickly kind of jump into the abolitionists. Can you walk us through kind of some of these spaces and, and the work that was being done to push back on enslavement? Yeah, and I mean, even to, just to, to, to speak as broadly as possible about the abolitionist movement as well is, you know, one, one thing that I think we don't appreciate as much today, we tell, you know, a story of uh, emancipation in this country that is a story of, you know, the march of progress. And when it comes to slavery, eventually, you know, we, we'd like to think, you know, the, the, the good guys win and there was an inevitable push that America is going to end up, of course, a free country. But for many abolitionists in the 1800s, it was an extraordinarily unpopular position. Even in the North, you could be subject to harassment, to violence. Um, and so th there's a way in which for the abolitionists, they are doing a deeply unpopular thing, but for the most, you know, moral and good of reasons. And, you know, for the abolitionist movement, they're seeing, you know, it, it works at at least two different levels. You know, one is the sheer human level, the human level of just horrible, how horrible slavery was, the forced labor, the violence, the separation of families. So they, the, the taking of husbands from wives, children from parents, that degradation, that in, inhumanity. It's it, not even second class citizenship, but something even worse than that in our country. They were re repulsed by that, often driven by even a, a religion, you know, they, often their, their Christian faith drove them into abolitionism. So there was a link between religion and this push towards anti-slavery and this push that again, was an unpopular position to take. The other part though, and I know we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of the divisions constitutionally, the constitutional arguments about slavery, but there was a way that also for many of the abolitionists, slavery degraded every right that we held most dear. The right to free speech, religious liberty, to, to marry and to have a family, to be, you know, to, to have a fair process before someone punishes you or takes away your freedom. The freedom to read, to learn, all of these things were degraded. So you have the human and physical cost of slavery coupled with all of these constitutional, uh, you know, all of these constitutional harms. And so um, I just wanted to at least say, and, and you know, the last thing you'll, you'll see, you know, looking at that all of the key abolitionists here up on your screen, it's very notable that the abolitionist movement itself was a, a movement that cut across race and it cut across gender. So you have leading African-Americans and leading, uh, you know, uh, white Americans, you have leading men, you have leading uh, women. And so it's a really broad based movement. It's a movement that grows in power throughout the 1800s. Uh, but again, it's one that faced a great deal of unpopularity at the very beginning. Can you walk us through all the faces there just so everybody knows? So, so far our students get Harriet Tedman and Sojourner Truth on the two ends. And then can you tell us the other three in the center? So that's, so that's uh, John Brown in the middle. And so John Brown is, uh, it remains a very controversial figure uh, today. So he is, you know, um, really a, a warrior, uh, a warrior for abolitionism. Um, and so he leads an, an anti, you know, an, an abolitionist crusade uh, uh, in, in Kansas, uh, literally that leads to bloodshed. And he himself ends up being a martyr to the cause of abolitionism. Um, and ends up being uh, ends up being executed um, in the end, and ends up again sort of being on the one hand, you know, people people ask it, it raises sort of that classic question, both of political change and constitutional change, which is how you know how far do you go for your beliefs? What you know what sort of um, you know how how do you balance sometimes doing really bad things like killing other people on behalf of a cause that you think is just? And John Brown, you know, sort of forces us to you know grapple with that head on. Awesome. And you, want to talk, um, okay. you want to talk about the other two I'm sorry, I'm just going to grab a drink. Sorry. I, I'm going to throw you guys um, a couple other hints about the other two, and then we will circle back at the end. Think great female leaders. Think um, the awesome name Harriet. 
and as well as great writers, great female writers. So I will let you go there and you guys keep guessing. Um, oh, nice. Very good. Very good. Um, I love the chat. And you guys can make sure if you want to share, it, share in the chat. Um, panelists and attendees and everybody can see it but Sarah and Anna good job you're getting extra points um, <laughs> very good so real quick time we, ha we have about like five maybe five ten minutes left um, do we want to jump into the the idea of the pro-slavery constitution the anti-slavery constitution with people like Calhoun people like Garrison and people like Frederick Douglass and again if you want to read what enslavement was like. The letters of Frederick Douglass are unbelievably moving. They will break your heart, but they will also give you a small little inkling of the pain that he went through. And just to be able to read them, they're amazing. His letter about his mother is the saddest thing I've ever read in my life, but so moving that all I wanted to do was read more about this time period. So they will change you in ways that keeps you diving into history deeper. So Tom, you wanna jump there and then we'll go through the reconstruction amendment. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so we see a range of views, a range of people laying claim to the Constitution's text and history. So we have pro-slavery voices saying the Constitution's text and history clearly lead in a pro-slavery direction. So the leading figure here is South Carolina's John C. Calhoun. And so his argument is pretty straightforward. We have text, we have the Constitution's text, things like the Three-Fifths Clause, the Fugitive Slave Clause, clearly recognizing our, you know, the slaveholders' power to hold enslaved people, making the Constitution a pro-slavery document. Furthermore, if you look to history, the Southern slaveholders obviously, obviously wouldn't have agreed to the Constitution if the Constitution cut in an anti-slavery direction. It's a, it was a compromise with slavery and therefore must uphold the slaveholders' power. And then finally, Calhoun and his allies would end up making even more aggressive arguments, saying that this text in history doesn't just say that the Congress, the national government, it doesn't just protect us from it doesn't just protect existing slaveholders from the national government coming in and taking slavery away from South Carolina, but it also makes it so that the national government can't protect slavery elsewhere in the federal territory. So it's a very strong pro-slavery vision. On the other side, we see uh, anti-slavery, abol the abolitionist anti-slavery folks making you know, two different arguments about the constitution. So William Lloyd Garrison leads his own wing, the Garrisonians, and weirdly they agree with John C. Calhoun. They say that fundamentally, the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. It's uh, you know, a covenant with death and agreement with hell, as they said, quite colorfully. And so you see Garrison and his allies like Wendell Phillips, they burn constitutions and they say, if you really care about slavery, stay out of politics, stay out of political parties, speak, preach, try to convince people through moral persuasion that they need to advance the cause of emancipation. So that's the Garrisonians. They argue the Constitution is fundamentally pro-slavery and that we need to change America's hearts and minds in order to, to uh, push towards emancipation. The other side of this argument though is led by Frederick Douglass, figures like Frederick, Frederick Douglass. So Douglass himself was a Garrisonian. He started as a Garrisonian, but he ends up changing his mind about the Constitution and he fundamentally he ends up framing it as you know, a glorious document of freedom. And so what, it is, what is his argument? Well, his argument is one, none of those clauses we talked about earlier mention the word slavery. And he says, you know, if you're studying American constitutional history, making constitutional arguments, don't go out of your way to try to find pro-slavery causes for the constitution. Take the constitution as we have it. Take it by the words as they exist. And what's in the constitution? Well, we have this glorious preamble, a preamble that moves us towards a more perfect union and bends in the direction of, 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 of freedom not slavery. We have things like the Fifth Amendment's due process clause, which speaks to people having a right to life, liberty, or property. Um, and so with that, Calhoun may say this is talking about the slaveholders. Well, Douglas is saying, no, we should read this on behalf of all enslaved people, of all Americans. And so it's, it's again, a document because of provisions like that that points in an anti-slavery, not a pro-slavery direction. Um, and so I have this great quote from Douglas I'd like to share, even though we're running out of time, where he says, you know, the Constitution's language is we the people. Not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people. If the South has made the Constitution bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. And so this is the really powerful argument by Douglas that you might as well take the Constitution as it exists and read it in the best, most anti-slavery way as we possibly can. And I love it. I love the idea of taking the Constitution and bending it to, for freedom. 
And then we go to my favorite Harriet to talk about, Harriet Scott. Um, so do you want to real quickly talk about Harriet and Dred Scott and then leading into the Civil War and then the Reconstruction Amendments and how this case eventually will lead to the 13th and the 14th Amendment, how to fix this case in a way? Yeah, so Dred Scott, it's a, it's a case in 1857. It's the most important and infam infamous decision on slavery before the Supreme Court. And you're right, Curry. I know Jeff likes to talk about it as history's most overturned decision because the yeah. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, those Reconstruction Amendments, are in many fundamental ways about attacking the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott. So who were Dred and Harriet Scott? Well, they were enslaved people who were brought onto free soil. And so their, their constitutional claim, their claim was, was pretty simple. We were brought on free soil, we're free. These are called freedom suits. We see them you know, throughout, the, throughout the North um, you know, in, in the 1800s. And so here, um, you, know, you said you know, our, another one of our favorite Harriet's Harriet Scott. Who is Harriet Scott? Well, you know, she was an enslaved person, but also a mother. She was a mother. She had two daughters. And so you know, from her perspective, she's saying, we've been on free soil, we're free, but I know what the law says. I know how these things usually work. I'm concerned about becoming enslaved again. And I'm concerned about my daughters having to go through that experience and the precariousness and the brutality of slavery. And so I'm gonna sue for my freedom. I'm gonna go to court and lay claim to freedom saying that I'm free, my family's free. And she convinces her husband, Dred Scott, to go along with it. And so the two of them end up before the Supreme Court advancing an argument for their own freedom. And the Supreme Court says no says no, you know, the most hard, you know, in, in many ways, the, the, the coldest and, and, and most chilling language that we see in the opinion is what Curry has on the screen there. It's an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Brooktani. And he says quite simply that African-Americans aren't citizens, they're not American citizens, and they quote, had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. And so, you know, with, with that, you know, that was bad enough, but Chief Justice Tony goes even further and says that furthermore, it goes out of his way, doesn't have to say that, but he says, furthermore, the national government Congress does not have the power to abolish slavery in the territories. And so it's a very strong pro-slavery opinion that in many ways writes Calhoun's vision of the constitution into American constitutional law. And so we see the Republican party, we see Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in his own candidacy, pushing back against Dred Scott, saying it's wrong, saying that African-Americans have been citizens since the beginning of the Republic and have rights that we're bound to respect and fight and say, we are going to fight against this vision of the constitution. We know Lincoln's elected the first anti-slavery president in 1860 and then the war came. And so I'll pause there before we get to reconstruction. Yeah, and um, it, it is unbelievable to dive into his, the opinion here. It is so long. Uh -huh. And it tries to grab international law as well to say, look, this is happening around the world and it's just untrue. So Tom, we, we have like three more minutes to wrap up. Do you wanna walk us through kind of the big ideas that come out of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment? I'll put in the interactive constitution in the chat so everybody can read the words directly, but do you wanna walk us through the big concepts that we think of when we think of these amendments? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I think the best way to think about it, Curry, is I'll start with the original constitution and then we'll do the then we'll do what's in the amendments. So you can really put the 1787 and the founding up against what we say is the second founding. So what, when we think about slavery, when we think about these issues with the original constitution, we see, you know, a, a, a few things, you know, one, of course, the original constitution didn't mention slavery, but it had those provisions we talked about at the beginning, the three fifths clause, the fugitive slave clause, which bent political power towards the slaveholding South. It didn't mention the Declaration of Independence's promise of equality. It said nothing about equality in the original constitution. And it said nothing about African American voting rights. If we remember the Bill of Rights as it was ratified at the founding applied only to the national government, it didn't apply to the states. And so the Southern states could violate key Bill of Rights protections like free speech and religious liberty whenever they wanted to. And in fact, they did abolishing abolitionist speech, abolishing abolitionist preaching. And then finally, as we said already, the citizenship rights were left to the states and to the courts with Roger Brooktani again saying African-Americans had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. And what happens after the Civil War? What happens during Reconstruction, during the second founding from 1865 to 1870 is really the period we're talking about? Well, our constitution abolished slavery. That's the 13th Amendment. and made everyone born on American soil a US citizen. It promised equality for all, and it protected us from state abuses of important Bill of Rights protections like free speech and religious liberty, that's all bundled into that 14th Amendment. It guaranteed the right to vote free of racial discrimination. That's the 15th Amendment. And it gave the national government the authority to protect the civil rights of all. This is a theme that runs through the 13th 
14th and 15th Amendment. So the argument here is that we really, we, you know, while we rightly revere George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, all of those famous framers for creating the greatest charter of human freedom in world history, we should similarly revere, we should similarly admire Abraham Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, Harriet Beecher Stowe, you know, all those figures we saw on this screen before, but also key Reconstruction Republicans like John Bingham, like Thaddeus Stevens, like Francis Harper, people who made the Constitution the more perfect document that it is today. Um, we know that the second founding wasn't perfect, Curry, obviously, but you know, 100 years later, it would take the efforts of Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement to really breathe life into the promise of these amendments. But this generation after the Civil War wrote those protections, wrote those principles into our very fabric, into our constitutional law, and created what Dr. King called a promissory note for later, to, for later generations to cash. And so we have, and so we continue to fight. That is a great way to wrap up. And I just wanted to add Rebecca's awesome question because it almost to me in some way, it, it is the promissory note. And so Rebecca's question in the chat was, how would you characterize the Reconstruction Amendment in terms of federalism, AKA incorporation? So is incorporation and the power given in each of those amendments part of how King used the constitution to ensure freedoms for all? Yeah, I mean, I think a great way to, that's a great question. And it, it, you know, the Reconstruction Amendments, all of them rebalance federalism, this, this division of power between the national government and the states. And so the, the way I think about it is the original constitution, the founding moment empowered the national government but created a government of limited powers. The Bill of Rights ends up restricting the powers of the national government more, but with the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, we see the national get government getting new power, new authority to promote things like civil and political rights. And part of that project, as you said in your question, was this project of what lawyers call incorporation, this idea that the Bill of Rights is now going to extend against abuses by the states. The Bill of Rights of the founding applies only to the national government after reconstruction, after additional decisions by the Supreme Court, the Bill of Rights, free speech, religious liberty, et cetera, is going to apply to the state abuses, apply to the states when they do wrong things. And this is a perfect way to wrap up. I'm gonna make sure that you all have the link to this program if you wanna watch it again. But also remember next week in class, we're gonna dive into incorporation even more because you can't do the reconstruction of Emmett's in one week. So we're gonna dive into incorporation next week. So Tom, thank you so much for this. This is great. Everybody, if you have questions, we're gonna end class now, but we'll hang out for the next five minutes just to follow up with any questions. But thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Curry. Thank you, everyone.